First, a quick recap. Why do we need to do this? Why do we need responsive design? The problem is that on the web, one size does not fit all. We have different devices, different needs, even different data requirements. And this is at the core of the PWA attitude to building for the web. We need layouts and content that work across devices. If your site doesn't adapt to the user's device, you break the illusion and lose trust. These quotes are from Brad Frost and Liza Danger Gardner. You should check out their blog posts about responsive design, which are linked to from the course materials. As Liza says, manage risk, focus on content. You know, you can make virtually any site usable simply by sizing elements and content correctly. The golden rule for great progressive web app content is not to let content inadvertently overflow horizontally, especially on mobile. That sounds basic, but lots of sites break this rule by making images, inputs, and other large elements on the page with fixed sizes. Using relative measurement units, M, RAM, percentages, will reduce the severity of this issue. Adding a meta viewport tag will also solve a lot of problems. This tells the browser the size of the virtual viewport on which it renders a web page. Without setting the viewport meta tag correctly, most browsers scale down a page to fit a virtual 980 pixel wide viewport. I've seen some great examples of this in action on W3 schools. We'll give you the URLs for that in the course materials with this video. The initial scale value sets the zoom default for this page. Don't set a maximum value. That will make it impossible for users to zoom, and that's a big problem for accessibility. One other thing you should be aware of, the viewport meta tag will mess up the layout for fixed width sites. The meta viewport tag is designed to work with responsive layouts. If you use it in a fixed sized layout, it will break things until you convert the site to a responsive layout. Try document.documentElement.clientWidth to see how the viewport meta tag affects the virtual viewport. Here's another simple technique. This solves many layout problems. You're setting the preferred size and the maximum size. And works for video and audio too. So, you know, you might think that relative sizing would fix everything. In fact, for a while back in the day, some of us thought that relative sizing could solve everything with layout. We had, you know, liquid layout. Maybe even text could be relatively sized. But relative sizing isn't enough. Simplistic relative sizing like this, the diagram, means that you have content areas that are too big on desktop and too small on mobile. This is why media queries were invented. It's a simple concept. Use different CSS for different sized viewports based on width. That doesn't just mean making the same layout fit every device. On a phone, you might want a single column layout, a two column layout on a tablet, maybe three column for desktop, and so on. You can use media queries to select different layouts depending on the viewport size. Here's a single column layout on mobile, two column on tablet, and three column for desktop. So you think about devices and you might think you could get away with this. Ask yourself, what could go wrong with this approach? What about new devices, new viewport sizes? What about changing window sizes on desktop? We'll come back to this later. Now, is that all there is? Of course not. There is a better way. Go back to our original exercise. Remember, content is king. Devices keep changing and device viewports are getting bigger and smaller, not to mention pixel density, pixel shape, display quality, and so on. Don't force your designers and developers to make a change every time a new device appears. Start the design process with the smallest form factor. Then, Add the major breakpoints for the form factors that you work with, phone, tablets, laptops, and widescreen devices. You can then create minor breakpoints to handle specific changes to elements that don't affect all elements. The final detail to keep in mind is to optimize the content for reading. Ideally, keep the width of your content to 70 to 80 characters. Wider than that value makes content hard to read. Now, that doesn't mean you stop thinking about devices and device classes. You might want one column for phones, two columns for tablets, three columns for desktop, like we're saying, or whatever. You can find out more about these recommendations on Web Fundamentals. Now, remember the earlier media queries example. 
In the mobile first world of PWAs, we need to turn that around. Make small viewports the default. Look at the example here. By the way, there is no fixed rule about whether or not to include media queries inline or use a separate file. Also, you might want to consider using EMS or REMS for units here, but I won't go into that now. You'll also do responsive layout in JavaScript if you like. This is a simple way to do conditional content. Match media is well supported and there are polyfills. Calc is really useful in responsive design where you want to use a combination of fixed widths and percentages. In this example, we have two thumbnail images side by side, 50% the width of the parent element with a 10 pixel margin between them, no matter what size the viewport. Responsive design is about more than just changing layouts. As well as changing layouts, you might actually also want to manipulate content depending on the viewport size and device type. For example, on a phone, you might want to make sure page content is visible when the user goes to your home page. So you might opt for a hamburger menu for navigation and put banner ads lower on the page. Also, if need be, you can just get rid of stuff. On desktop, your users will want full functionality, but not on mobile, right? Wrong. Don't guess your users' needs based on viewport size. Plan content and functionality carefully, and don't assume users want less content or less functionality on phones than desktop, for example. Again, this is a crucial part of the PWA attitude. Understand your users, don't second guess them. Data-driven design. Design content, layouts, and transaction processes so users can get to what they want as quickly as possible. Our data shows that every step to get to content loses 20% of users. Rather than removing content, a more sensible option can be to choose different content. Now, for images, this is called art direction, choosing different images for different image crops. And I'll show an example of this later. You might even want to provide different text for different viewports, such as shorter headlines. But yeah, be careful again not to assume that mobile users want less content. For video, the general rule is to use a smaller resolution for smaller viewports. This can result in massive reductions in bite size, playback performance, improvements, and also reduced streaming cost. The best way to do this is with adaptive streaming, Dash or HLS, not just media queries. And yeah, you can find out more about that, more about adaptive streaming in the course materials. But just to reiterate, the key point here is that when you're delivering video to mobile, don't use resolutions larger than you need. And talking about video content, don't forget to caption videos using the track element. It's really easy. Let's take a look at the relatively new technique for creating responsive layouts. CSS Flexbox provides flexible sizing and alignment, element reordering, and better performance than floats. CSS Flexbox is well supported, and we strongly recommend it. Ah, easy centering is the holy grail of CSS. Take a look at the code here. It's, it's incredibly simple. I still find it slightly thrilling. Anyway, by the way, the materials that accompany this video have links to lots of Flexbox examples, including this one. Let's look at the CSS for the examples here. This uses CSS Flexbox for three different layouts, depending on the viewport width. Let's start with the defaults for smaller viewports. Remember, mobile first. The container is declared to use CSS Flex. The Flex Flow property means child elements can wrap rather than being squashed onto the same line. You can also use inline flex. That's shorthand for flex direction and flex wrap properties. The default is row, no wrap. 100% width for each div in the container. Add a different layout for a slightly larger viewport. And different again once the width hits 800 pixels. The container is now a fixed width and centered horizontally using margins. Let's take a look at the example here. Once again, this uses CSS Flexbox for three different layouts depending on the viewport width. And again, let's start with the defaults for smaller viewports. For viewports over 600 pixels in width, the order is changed. On the smaller viewports, we wanted to give child one full width. But for a slightly larger viewport, we can put it next to child two. I could go on. Anyway, two other properties I'd like to draw your attention to. Justify content, how items are packed, and align items, how items are aligned. 
CSS Grid is in some ways related to the grid system concept familiar to graphic designers. A page is thought of in terms of lines, tracks between lines, cells and areas. CSS Grid is coming and it's already behind a flag in Chrome and Firefox. You'll find more information in the resources for this video. The lab exercises that accompany this video will help you get started with media queries, breakpoints, grids, and with Flexbox.